Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and today I want to show you about a mystery called the Two Houses of Israel. This mystery will explain why the Christians are the lost ten tribes of Israel, and why both the Jews and the Christians are secretly estranged brothers in the Abrahamic Covenant. Have you ever wondered why the Apostle Yaakov, or James, wrote his epistle not to the Christians, but to the twelve tribes of Israel, who were scattered abroad? And have you ever wondered why, in Revelation chapter 7, we read that the twelve tribes of Israel are sealed from harm, but we're never told of any Christians being sealed from harm? Further, when the new Jerusalem comes down from the heavens in Revelation chapter 21, why are there no gates for Christians, but only gates for the twelve tribes of Israel? Further, why did the Messiah Yeshua, whom some called Jesus Christ, say that he was not sent, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And why did he come only for them? There are many mysteries in Scripture, and once we understand the mystery of the two houses, then we can understand Bible prophecy like never before. To explain this mystery, we need to dig into some detail, and this can take some effort, but this effort is well worth it, because once we understand the course of events in Scripture, then the prophecies unfold before us clearly, and we can understand the flow of Bible prophecy with a clarity that's not possible to achieve in any other way. So please join us now for the mystery of the two houses. begin unraveling the mystery of the two houses of Israel, let's understand that in the Bible, the Creator Yahweh, or Jehovah, gave special promises to the patriarch Abraham, or Avraham. The Bible says that these special promises were given to Avraham and his descendants, or as the Bible puts it, to his seed. This is because Avraham obeyed Yahweh's voice. This tells us that obedience to Yahweh's commandments is important. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17, Yahweh tells Avraham, Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants, or your seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand of the seashore. And your descendants, or your seed, shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Yahweh then repeated these blessings to Avraham's son Isaac, telling Isaac that the reason he and his seed would be blessed was because Avraham had obeyed his voice and kept his charge, his statutes, and his laws. In other words, Yahweh blessed Avraham because he was obedient. In Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4 we read, And I will make your descendants, or your seed, multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, referring to the land of Israel. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Avraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Yahweh also gave these same promises to Avraham's grandson, Jacob, or Israel. And although it might seem difficult to understand, in Genesis chapter 28, Yahweh promised Israel that one day, every family on earth, including you and I, would have some of his genetics, and that one day, Yahweh would call a remnant of his descendants to come back to the covenant and back to the land of Israel. Now there's a special two-part promise here that many Jews and Christians miss. We discuss it in more detail in the Nazarene Israel study, 
But if we read this very carefully, what we see is that Yahweh gives his promise first to Israel, meaning to his genetic descendants, and then also to his seed, which we will see refers to the Messiah Yeshua. Let's read it carefully. And behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the Elohim or God of Abraham your father, and the Elohim of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants, or your seed. And your descendants, or seed, shall be as the dust of the earth. And you, meaning your descendants, shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you, meaning your descendants, back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. In Galatians 3 and verse 16, the apostle Shaul, or Paul, tells us that the reference to Israel's seed is a reference to the Messiah. But notice how there's also a genetic promise. In verse 14, the promise was that all the families of the earth would be blessed both in Israel, meaning genetically, and in his seed, referring to the Messiah. Yet it's Israel's physical children who are prophesied to spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and one day come back home to the land of Israel. On the one hand, the Orthodox Jews understand the promises given to the physical descendants of Israel to return home to the land of Israel. And on the other hand, the Christians understand the promise given to those who accept the good seed, Messiah Yeshua, as their personal Savior and King. Yet to realize the fullness of this promise, we need to realize both parts. As we follow the Bible story, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac then begat Jacob, who was later called Israel. In turn, Israel had 12 sons. And at least originally, all 12 of Israel's sons together were considered part of Israel's house, or what scripture calls the house of Israel. But we need to understand this term clearly because the definition of this term house of Israel will change and that's part of why the mystery has been sealed up for the past 2,730 years. So let's keep following the story to learn the prophetic significance attached to two special sons of Israel, Judah and Joseph. Judah was Israel's fourth son and Judah's children were called the Jews. So at least spiritually, the Jews of today descend from the patriarch Judah. But two other tribes would later be attached to Judah, Benjamin and Levi. And together, these would later be called the house of Judah. Now, someone will ask about the Khazars, and that's a very involved question. The short answer is that there are secretly two houses of Judah in the prophecies. We'll talk about the Khazars in other places, but for right now we want to stay focused on the basics. Israel's 11th son was named Joseph, and as we'll see, Joseph was the spiritual father of both the Christians and the Nazarenes. And if you don't know the difference between Christians and Nazarenes, do yourself a favor and watch the first video in this series right now, because the difference of understanding is critical and we'll come back to it time and again. We'll put a link below so you can find it more easily. One of the things we need to know about Joseph is that Joseph was Israel's favorite son, and Israel famously gave Joseph a long coat. Most Bible translations call it a coat of many colors, but in Hebrew, what it says is that Israel gave Joseph a ketonet pasim, which is a long tunic, reaching to the sole of the foot, similar to a bridal gown. 
Such long coats were only worn by the rich or by royalty because manual laborers couldn't wear a long tunic like that or it would get destroyed in the fields. Because of this, Joseph's other brothers were jealous and they hated Joseph. And because of their bitter envy, they sold Joseph down into slavery in Egypt and faked his death to their father. The original fake dues. Yet Yahweh had a plan for Joseph. While in Egypt, Joseph was made the second in command over all Egypt, second only to Paro or Pharaoh. And while serving as the second in command of Egypt, Joseph married the daughter of an Egyptian high priest and had two sons by her. The first son's name was Manasseh, and the second son's name was Ephraim, or Ephraim. Together, these two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, formed Joseph's house, or what scripture calls the house of Joseph. It's highly significant that Joseph's two sons are half Egyptian, and that their mother was the daughter of a pagan high priest, because this determines their spiritual predispositions. We'll come back to that fact later, but for now, just remember that Ephraim and Manasseh are half-breeds. In Genesis chapter 48, Israel famously prophesied that Joseph's sons, Ephraim's descendants, would become greater than those of Manasseh's. And there's some very special language hidden in the Hebrew of Genesis 48 and verse 16. In most translations, Israel blesses Ephraim and Manasseh's children, saying, Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth, meaning they would become many among the Gentile nations. But what it says in the Hebrew is, Ve'idegu l'rov bekerev ha'aretz, meaning, Let them teem like a multitude of fishes in the midst of the earth. And if we have eyes to see, this reference to teeming like a multitude of fishes in the midst of the earth is a reference to the Christians. The Christians are indeed many, and they are among the Gentiles, and it is the Christians who use the fish as their symbol. But why do they use the fish as their symbol? Is it commanded anywhere? In other studies, we'll see that the fish was the symbol of the Philistine fish god Dagon, which makes the fish a pagan symbol, which means it is unclean and should not be used. The reason the Christians use it is they do not realize their identities as Israelites, and so they do not realize that the commandments for the children of Israel not to use the images of pagan gods also applies to them. In other videos, we'll also see how this prophecy ties into Yeshua's command that we should become fishers of men. For those with ears to hear, this is what is called in Hebrew a remez, or a hint, that Yeshua's disciples should fish for the lost tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, who are dwelling like a multitude of fishes in the midst of the earth. And if you want to know more about that, please read the Nazarene Israel study. So what we want to know is, who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel that Yeshua came for? To understand the answer to this question, we need to look at a long progression of terms. It gets a little complicated, and this is at least part of why the mystery got sealed up. So we need to read it carefully. The term house of Joseph is used as early as Joshua 17 and verse 17 where it refers to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh together. Verse 17 reads, And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people and have great power. You shall not have only one lot, meaning one portion in the land of Israel. We don't have time to go into all the details here, but in the Nazarene Israel study, we show that the United Kingdom and the United States have historically played key roles in spreading the faith worldwide. We show how the United Kingdom fulfills the prophetic role of the tribe of Manasseh and was the older of Joseph's two sons, who was spreading the faith in Messiah 
before Ephraim was. We also show how the United States fulfills the prophetic role of the tribe of Ephraim, who was the younger son that went on to become the greater. And the Christian United Kingdom plus the Christian United States do seem as if they have more than the average lot worldwide. This is because Yahweh has blessed them for studying and spreading at least their variation of his son's good news. Next, in Judges 10 and verse 9, we begin to see the tribe of Ephraim take the lead among the ten northern tribes. The people of Ammon, which is in modern-day Jordan, attacked the tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the south. And both of those tribes would later become part of what's called the southern house of Judah. But they also attacked the other ten tribes in the north, which were called the house of Ephraim, showing how Joseph's son Ephraim began to take the lead among the ten tribes in the north. Judges 10 and verse 9 reads, Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah, also against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that all Israel was severely distressed. From this point forward, the term house of Ephraim will refer to the ten northern tribes. Next, in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4, we see that the tribe of Judah in the south begins to be referred to as the house of Judah, even though the tribes of Benjamin and Levi have not yet been attached to it. This means that the house of Judah still consists of only one tribe at this point. 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4 reads, Then the men of Judah came, and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. It can be difficult to keep track of all the name changes, but it's important to do so because there's meaning to the changes. And now we'll see a most interesting change that will literally change the course of Scripture prophecy. Ten chapters later, in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 8, Yahweh calls the ten northern tribes of the house of Ephraim the house of Israel. In this verse, Yahweh is speaking to King David of the house of Judah after he's murdered Bathsheba's husband. He says, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the northern house of Israel and the house of Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Now, it's important to see this because originally the term house of Israel referred to all 12 of the tribes, whereas now Yahweh uses it only toward the northern 10 tribes. Let's ask ourselves why. The reason Yahweh called the 10 northern tribes the house of Israel is that he planned to join a portion of the southern kingdom of Judah to them so that the term house of Israel would once again refer to all 12 of the tribes. And there's more to say about that than we have time to explain here. But to see the basics of it, let's consider how the northern house of Israel got taken into physical and spiritual captivity, and how a remnant of the southern house of Judah got taken into captivity right along with them. In 1 Kings chapters 11 and 12, we read about the formal split that took place in the nation of Israel between the two houses. The reason for the split was that the northern ten tribes were not keeping the Torah correctly. The northern house of Ephraim, or Israel, was calling on the name of Elohim, or God, but they were not obeying his laws or keeping his ways, just like their descendants, the Christians, would later do. One of the basic principles of Scripture is that living beings reproduce after their own kinds such as we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 11, where Elohim says to let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is within itself, on the earth. And it was so. And in that light, 
Let's remember that Ephraim was a half-breed child of a very faithful and favored Hebrew father and the daughter of an Egyptian high priest. With a mix like that, we might well expect the Ephraimites to be very spiritual and very favored, but also to incorporate the worship of pagan deities, just like the Christians who would come later. However, it was not just the northern kingdom that worshipped foreign deities. The trigger event for the split between the two houses was that King David's son Solomon took too many foreign wives, and these foreign wives did not convert to the worship of Yahweh. Rather, King Solomon's foreign wives turned his heart away from Yahweh so that he worshipped their foreign deities instead. Scripture says King Solomon clung to these foreign deities in love. And that was the main problem, as Yahweh strictly prohibits the worship of idols. The punishment for King Solomon's idolatry was that the nation of Israel would be split into two parts. This would take place in the days of King Solomon's son, King Rehoboam. After the split took place, from then on, there would be two separate kingdoms. One kingdom with ten tribes in the north, called the kingdom of Israel, or the kingdom of Ephraim, and occasionally called Joseph. Then there would be another kingdom with two tribes in the south, called the kingdom of Judah, and occasionally called Jacob. Before the split, in 1 Kings 11 and verse 28, we read that King Solomon had an Ephraimite servant named Jeroboam. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and King Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the slave labor force of the house of Joseph, or Ephraim. Now it happened that when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that he met the prophet Ahiah the Shilonite on the way, and Ahiahoah had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in a field. Then Ahiah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you, but he shall have one tribe, meaning in addition to Judah, for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, or Easter, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the goddess of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments, as his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him ruler all the days of his life, for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand, and give it to you, ten tribes." And to his son I will give one tribe, meaning in addition to Judah, meaning the tribe of Benjamin, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself, to put my name there. After the death of King Solomon, the ten tribes called Jeroboam, and the whole assembly came to King Solomon's son, King Rehoboam, in Jerusalem, and told him, that his father King Solomon had made their yoke heavy. They asked him to lighten the hard service of his father, and then they would serve him. But King Rehoboam refused, even promising to increase their mistreatment. Because of this, the ten northern tribes realized that King Rehoboam didn't love them as King David had, and they had no portion. Therefore they broke away from King Rehoboam in the kingdom of Judah in the south and formed their own kingdom in the north. And from this point forward, we see the kingdom of Ephraim or the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. 
but the new king, Jeroboam, had a big problem. Yahweh had prophesied through Ahiah that if Jeroboam would heed all that he commanded him and walk in his ways and do what was right in his sight and keep his statutes and his judgments as King David did, then Yahweh would be with him and build for him an enduring house as he built for David and he would give Israel to him. Only the scriptures call for the people to worship in the place where Yahweh had chosen to place his name, which was Jerusalem. And in 1 Kings 12 and verse 27, we see how the new king, Jeroboam, reasoned with himself that if the people actually did what the Torah said and went up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then the heart of his people would turn back to their original master, King Rehoboam of Judah. Then someone would kill him, and the people would go back to King Rehoboam of Judah. Therefore, King Jeroboam asked advice as to what he should do to prevent this from happening. The answer was that he had to make a false religion and to change the people's worship so they wouldn't want to go up to Jerusalem anymore. Therefore, the king made two calves of gold, and he said to the people, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one golden calf in Bethel, and the other golden calf he put in Dan, in the north. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one golden calf as far as Dan rather than at the temple in Jerusalem. King Jeroboam also made false places of worship on the high places, and he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. King Jeroboam also ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the original Feast of Tabernacles that the house of Judah still kept in the 7th month, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. He did this at Bethel, and he sacrificed to the golden calves that he had made. And at the false altar at Bethel, he also ordained the non-Levitical priesthood, who served in the false places of worship that he had made. So King Jeroboam made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, rather than on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, like the Torah says, the eighth month being a month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a false calendar for the children of Israel, or Ephraim, and offered sacrifices on the altar, and burned incense. Now, if we have eyes to see it, point for point, this is an exact prophetic shadow picture of what the Catholic Church would later do. While the Messiah Yeshua and his disciples kept the original Passover and the original Feast of Tabernacles, the Catholic Church pushed the date of the Passover back to Easter. They also pushed the date of the Feast of Tabernacles back to Christmas. Further, the Catholic Church established a new priesthood that was not of the sons of Levi. They also instituted idol worship in multiple locations that were not Jerusalem. And they also altered the scriptures in support of their new religion, just as Jeroboam had done. In the Nazarene Israel study, we talk about how Yahweh sent many prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel to get them to turn back from this false worship and turn back to the Torah. Yahweh sent Elijah and Elisha and many other prophets to get the northern kingdom to turn back. One of the prophets Yahweh sent to the northern kingdom was named Hoshea, or Hosea. Hoshea was told to take a harlot for a wife and to have children of harlotry. This was symbolic of how the children of Israel were committing idolatry, or spiritual adultery, against him. Now the names of the children were all prophetic. In Hoshea 1, in verse 2, we see that when Yahweh began to speak by Hoshea, Yahweh said to Hoshea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, 
for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from Yahweh. So Hoshea went and took a prostitute by the name of Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then Yahweh said to him, Call his name Jezreel, meaning Yahweh will scatter, or sow like seed is sown, since they were Avraham's seed. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then Elohim said to him, Call her name Lo Ruhamah, meaning no mercy or no compassion. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Then, when she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. And Elohim said, Call his name Lo Ami, meaning not my people, for you are not my people, and I will not be your Elohim. Yahweh said he would cut off the house of Ephraim from the land of Israel because of their disobedience and sow them into the earth in a great seeding, just as the seed of Avraham was to be mixed with the seed of all the families of the earth, so that those who would accept the good seed, Yeshua, could one day be brought back to the covenant and back to the land of Israel. And that's why Yahweh said that the number of the children of Israel would yet be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered, and that it would come to pass in the place in the land of Israel where it had been said to them, You are not my people, that there it would be said to them, You are again the sons of the living Elohim. And then, once Armageddon was over, the children of Judah and the children of Israel would be gathered together and would appoint for themselves one head, and they would come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel, or the great seeding. This is the passage the Apostle Shaul, or Paul, refers to in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 24, when he tells the Gentiles that they're not Gentiles without a past, but that they are the lost ten tribes of Israel, or Ephraim. And this is why he says that it was not only the Jews who were called, but also the Gentile Ephraimites, as Yahweh says also in Hoshea, I will call them my people, Ami, who were not my people, Lo Ami, and her beloved, who was not beloved, referring to Lo Ruhamah. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall again be called the sons of the living Elohim. But sadly, in the days of Hoshea, the Ephraimites didn't turn back to Yahweh, and so ultimately Yahweh sent the Assyrians to punish them by taking them into captivity in Assyria. Second Kings chapter 17 and verse 5 tells us how the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, and besieged it for three years. And then in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried the northern ten tribes of Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. And this was because the children of Israel had sinned against Yahweh their Elohim, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And they had feared other gods and walked in the ways of the nations whom Yahweh had cast out from before the children of Israel, and also the false statutes of the kings of Israel, which they had made for themselves. The children of the northern ten tribes of Israel secretly did against Yahweh their Elohim things that were not right, and they built for themselves false places of worship in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places, like the nations whom Yahweh had carried away before them, and they did wicked things to provoke Yahweh to anger. For they served idols, of which Yahweh had said to them, you shall not do this thing. 
Yet Yahweh testified against the house of Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the Torah of Moshe or Moses, which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, the northern ten tribes of Israel, or Ephraim, would not hear, but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers, who, Scripture says, did not believe in Yahweh their Elohim, because they did not obey him. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers, and his testimonies, which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and incorporated the pagan practices of the nations who were all around them, just like the Christians would later do, concerning whom Yahweh had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of Yahweh their Elohim, made for themselves a molded image and two calves, made a wooden image and worshipped all the host of the heaven and served Baal, which is an ancient Middle Eastern name meaning the Lord. But it was not only the ten northern tribes the Assyrians would take into captivity, because the Assyrians did not stop at the border. They didn't care about the difference between the northern and the southern kingdoms. They only wanted to expand their empire as much as possible. And that's why 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 13 tells us that in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of the southern kingdom of Judah and took them as well. Because of this, representatives of all twelve tribes of Israel went into captivity in Assyria. The Assyrian policy was to treat those who adopted and assimilated into the Assyrian culture well and to punish those who did not. Because of this, the Ephraimites assimilated so well that they forgot all about Yahweh and his Torah. This took place in order to fulfill Hosea 8 and verse 8, which tells us that Israel is swallowed up. They are now among the Gentiles like a vessel in which there is no pleasure. But what does it mean that Israel was swallowed up? Consider that when we eat food, our bodies break it down and digest it completely. After a day or so, it's no longer possible to tell the difference between the food we ate yesterday and us. Our Jewish brethren watched all this from afar, and they recorded their impressions in an important historical document called the Talmud. And although the Talmud is not scripture, and it's not inspired, it does record the thoughts and observations of the most respected Jewish religious authorities of those times. And in Talmud tractate Yebamot 17a, the Jewish sages record that the Ephraimites that had been taken into captivity in Assyria began to father what they called strange children. They called them strange because they no longer kept the Torah, no longer spoke Hebrew, and no longer cared about Yahweh or their inheritance in the land of Israel. As the Talmud puts it, they had become perfect heathens. Let's read it. When I mentioned the matter in the presence of Samuel, he said to me, The Ephraimites did not move from there until the Jewish sages had declared the Ephraimites to be perfect heathens. As it is said in the scriptures, they have dealt treacherously against Yahweh, for they have begotten strange children. Eventually, the Assyrian Empire broke up, but since the sons of Ephraim had become perfect heathens and strange children, they didn't feel any desire to come back to the land of Israel or to the covenant or to Yahweh. So where did they go? We know that some individuals must have gone in all four directions, because the prophecy given to Israel was that every family on earth would have at least some of Israel's DNA. Yet there's another mystery here. Bible scholars such as Raymond Capt, Stephen Collins, Yair Davidi, and others 
who have researched the archaeological and historical evidence surrounding the migrations of the tribes tell us that it takes eyes to see it, but that as the Assyrian Empire fell, other empires arose in their place. And with the rise and fall of empires, the societies that manifested the most Israelite traits migrated north and west by three separate migration routes. One route ran up the Iberian Peninsula, while another route went overland through Turkey, and a third route went up through the Caucasus Mountains. These three separate migration routes ultimately converged in what later became Protestant Northwestern Europe, and then, after the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants spread their Torahless variation of the faith to the rest of the world. The fact that the tribes moved as prophetic bodies and ultimately settled in northwestern Europe accounts for the rise of Protestantism in that part of the world and the many blessings of prosperity and happiness that come from studying and living Yahweh's word more closely. We give more details in Nazarene Israel, but right now we want to look at a very special prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 4, which governs the timing of Ephraim's return. In Ezekiel chapter 4, Yahweh prophesied through Ezekiel that if the Ephraimites did not turn back, they would be taken into captivity for some 390 years. Yahweh told Ezekiel to lie on his left side and to lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that Ezekiel would lie on it, he would bear their iniquity, for Yahweh had laid on him the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days. It was 390 days that he would bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And in this prophecy, Yahweh was using the principle of a day for each year. Since the Assyrian dispersion began around 732 BCE, if we add 390 years to that, we arrive at 342 BCE. Only the Ephraimites didn't repent in 342 BCE. So what happened? In verses like Leviticus 26 and verse 18, Yahweh tells us that if we do not repent and start to obey him, then he will punish us yet seven times more for our sins. And if we multiply the prophesied 390 years of punishment times seven, we get 2,730 years of punishment. And since the Assyrian dispersion began around 732 BCE, when we add 2,730 years of punishment to that, we come up with an approximate end date for the captivity of around 1998 CE. Not coincidentally, 1998 CE is about when what is known as the Two House Movement began to grow, and Nazarene Israel is an outgrowth of this Two House Movement. For another witness, Hoshea was one of the prophets sent to the northern kingdom of Israel to get them to turn back to the Torah. And in Hoshea chapter 5, Yahweh prophesied that he himself would punish the northern kingdom to get them to turn back. Then in Hoshea 6 and verse 2, Yahweh prophesied that the northern kingdom would finally come back and return to Yahweh. The Ephraimites would realize that it was Yahweh that had torn him, but that Yahweh would heal him and that it was Yahweh that had stricken him, but that Yahweh would bind him up. And that after two prophetic days, Yahweh would revive the house of Ephraim. And on the third day, Yahweh would raise the Ephraimites up and cause them to live in his sight. So what is this reference to two prophetic days? In 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, the apostle Peter, or Kepha, tells us that in prophecy, a day with Yahweh is as a thousand years, and a thousand earth years is as a prophetic day. Therefore, 
the house of Ephraim, or Israel, would begin to come spiritually back from the dead, beginning 2,000 years after some special date. So what is that special date? Scholars dispute the exact date of the Messiah Yeshua's birth, but most agree that it was around 4 BCE. Two prophetic days, or 2,000 years after 4 BCE, brings us to about 1996 CE, which is about the same as Ezekiel's prediction of 1998 CE, which again is about the time the two-house movement began to get underway. So now consider, if 2,000 years from the Messiah's birth was a special date for the restoration of the house of Ephraim, then it only stands to reason that 2,000 years from the Messiah's ministry, burial, and resurrection will also be special dates. And if Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his ministry, that brings us to about 2026 CE, while 2,000 years from his death, burial, and resurrection is about 2030 CE. So what kind of restoration can we expect to see for the house of Ephraim on these prophetic dates? They're not far off. And speaking of the house of Ephraim's return, now let's try reading Yeshua's parable of the prodigal son with the understanding that the older son is Judah while the younger son is Ephraim. Starting in Luke 15 and verse 11, Yeshua said, A certain man, Yahweh, had two sons, Judah and Ephraim. And the younger of them, Ephraim, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods, meaning the inheritance, that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, as when the kingdom was divided in the days of King Jeroboam. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country in the Assyrian dispersion, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living becoming a perfect heathen. But when he had spent all, meaning he'd left the Torah completely and become a strange child, there arose a severe famine, meaning a famine of spiritual food in that land, and he began to be in want because he was now worshipping idols among the pagans of the nations. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, referring to the Roman Catholic Church. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine, referring to the idols of the church. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, referring to the sacrifices, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself in the Protestant Reformation, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, meaning they have true spiritual food, but I perish with spiritual hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you for departing from your Torah, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father in the Protestant Reformation. But when he was still a great way off, meaning he was still only a Protestant Christian, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And that's why the Protestant nations have historically been more blessed than the Catholic ones. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, referring to Joseph's coat, and put a ring on his hand, referring to Joseph's signet ring, and put sandals on his feet, because in ancient times royalty and the wealthy were the ones who wore shoes. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son Ephraim was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son, Judah, was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. 
So he called one of the servants and asked what these things might mean. And he said to him, Your brother Ephraim has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But Judah was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Behold, these many years I've been serving you, and I never transgressed a commandment in your Torah at any time. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, notice he doesn't even call him his brother, he who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Judah, my son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. But it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother Ephraim was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Most Christians read this story and think, oh, what a nice story about a backslidden sinner. And it is that but they never stop to think about the greater historical context that Yeshua was referring to. Perhaps this is because most Christians don't realize that the renewed covenant was not written in a historical vacuum, and it wasn't intended to be understood in a historical vacuum. They don't realize that the renewed covenant was written by devout Jews, who wrote it first and foremost for other devout Jews, and then also for Gentile Ephraimite converts to the faith. We need this historical context if we're to understand the true message and meaning of the book. We also need this historical context to understand what Yeshua meant in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 when he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. When Yeshua said that he was sent to proclaim liberty to the captives, he wasn't saying that he and his followers were going to go and open all the prison and jail cells. Rather, what he was saying was that he came to begin a 2,000-year-long process of setting the captives free and recovering those of the 12 tribes of Israel who'd been taken into captivity in Assyria and who'd still not returned back to the land of Israel or back to the covenant, because they were still in spiritual captivity. The subject of the spiritual captivity is fairly complex, but what we'll see in future teachings is that Yeshua came to begin a long process of setting the captives of all twelve tribes of Israel free, both of the house of Ephraim and the secret hidden house of Judah, so that one day they could come back to the land of Israel and back to their inheritance in the Torah and serve as functioning, contributing parts of the nation of Israel. This is also why Yaakov, or James, wrote his epistle to the twelve tribes of Israel who were scattered abroad. Notice he doesn't write it to the Christians. This is also why the apostle Kepha, or Peter, wrote his first epistle to the pilgrims of the Assyrian dispersion. The term dispersion is another name for the diaspora, or the great seeding, referring to Avraham's seed. He's literally writing to those whom the Assyrians took captive, the Ephraimites. In 2 John 1, the elder, who is John, writes to the elect lady, who is Joseph's mother Rachel and also to her children, meaning Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And then in verse 13, when he says, the children of your elect sister greet you, he's talking about Judah, or the house of Judah, who was the most prominent son of Israel's other main wife, Leah. So now can we understand why in Revelation chapter 7, It's not the Christians who are sealed from harm before the great tribulation, but the 12 tribes of Israel. And can we understand why in Revelation chapter 21, when the city of renewed Jerusalem comes down from the heavens, there are no gates for the Christians, 
there are only gates for the 12 tribes of Israel. So if we want to enter the renewed Jerusalem, don't we need to belong to the 12 tribes? And now can we understand what the Messiah Yeshua meant in Matthew 15 and verse 24 when he said that he was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And there's so much more than this. Once our eyes are opened to the two houses of Israel, then we can begin to understand the scriptures with more clarity than we ever thought possible. And yet there are dangers here also. It's very easy to do the wrong thing with this new information. And most two house believers are doing the wrong thing with it. But our goal here at Nazarene Israel is to help you do the right thing with this information so that you can get your best reward. If you have a desire to understand this topic in detail, we encourage you to read the copy of the Nazarene Israel study. You can read it for free on the website, or you can download a PDF copy for free. You can also purchase a paperback copy on Amazon.com for the same price it costs us. If you read that study, you will know more about your Bible than literally 99% of the Christians and Jews worldwide. But to help you understand the Messiah's mission more clearly, in our next video, we hope to give you an overview of the first century, because this will show us what the Messiah came to do much more clearly, as well as how we can please him today. Please join us for our next video. Shalom.